keep it covered up. And she was one of four people, including me, seen on security cameras entering his room within two hours before he died. You have records of the security cameras? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I was a little distracted. What would you tell me that my husband's murder was the best thing that ever happened to you? <laughs> Here. It's a list of everyone who went into his room within two hours before he died. Anna Felden, Danielle O'Brien, Riley Putnam, and Vanessa Evans. Vanessa's my younger sister, actually. You don't have to bother interviewing her. She couldn't have possibly killed Henry. She's on the list. She's a suspect in the case. Yes, but... Oh, all right. Splendid. We'll start the interviews first thing. Well, I don't exactly know 
and all the above. We've only met a few times. You've known Dr. Feldman for seven years, and you've only met his wife a few times. Well, Henry was a fairly reserved man. His work life and family life hardly ever met. And you, Miss Evans, how is your relationship with Henry? My relationship with Henry is good, I guess. I mean, we only started talking again recently. I moved here a year ago from Chicago, so with the work and location, and I saw Henry on the holidays. And did you approve of your sister marrying Dr. Feldman? I'll be honest, at first, it was a bit weird. We used to date after all, but after a while, it got more comfortable. He was a good fit for Anna. Is there something you'd like to add, Miss Feldman? Me? Oh no, nothing. I just think it's funny how you describe him to be a good fit for me. You see, that's how he acted when I first met him. And then I realized that he actually was an insane workaholic who never left the hospital long enough to breathe. I'm sorry, this is just too weird. It's all right, I understand. Maybe you don't have to sit out my interview. Would that be okay? Yes, I was just about to suggest that. Maybe you can go on the hall or keep Dr. O'Brien or Riley company. Thank you, I'll go wait in the hall. You know, she really didn't mean any of that. She's just under a lot of stress. I understand, although she seems to be taking it quite well. Oh, Anna, scared me. I thought you were in the interview with your sister. I was, but I thought Vanessa might be better off answering questions without me there. So how's work? Work? Oh, it's, it's as good as can be expected. I'm sure. So how's the new promotion? Oh, well, I haven't exactly had much time. Oh, silly me. Right, I forgot. Henry really died a few weeks ago, so of course you wouldn't have had that much time to settle in. Seeing that the job you have now formerly belonged to a man who's now dead. Good. I just wanted to give the wrong impression of her. And what impression did you think I received? Oh, I don't know that she's unbalanced or temperamental. What are you implying, Anna? Hmm, I don't know. Let me think. Maybe that you killed my husband so you can take his job. Because she's not. In all the years I've known her, she's never been quick to anger. <laughs> How dare you! Your husband was my friend for seven years! Seven years! Do you think that means nothing to me? Then why did the hospital do anything? They should have investigated or something. With the new promotion, you're high enough in the ranks to keep it covered up. I had to go out and hire a detective just to get people to notice my husband was dead. Thank you, Ms. Evans. It helps for me to know as much as I can about it. Although, I think we're going to need a change of tactics here soon. I just have to get the general information out before the real one. Fine. Oh, yes. This time we found out exactly what happened to Henry when he died. Oh, if you'll all just gather over there, we're going to talk through the death of Henry minute by minute. Actually, before we start, I was wondering if I could have a word. I have the feeling I know where this is heading, and I don't want you thinking it was Riley who did this because he couldn't have. He's like a son to me, and I swear he might have a good reason to despise Henry, but that doesn't make him a killer. Why do you think I'd assume Mr. Putnam did this? Well, his outburst from earlier, you started talking about temper. And Dr. O'Brien, I assure you, I'm not going to accuse anyone of murder until all the facts are out there. Take what you said into account, though. Actually, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. All right, then. Did Dr. Feldman have anyone that might have a grudge against him? No, I don't believe so. Oh, really? Because you say that Mr. Putnam is like a son to you. Surely you know how he interacts with others. And Miss Feldman informed me that he didn't get along with Henry very well at all. She said that after all I've done for her. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't know half the story. Well, I've heard her side, but I'd like to hear your words. I don't know. I think it would be best to talk to Riley about this. Right now, Miss Feldman has Riley in a tight position. I need to hear your side of the story. He's innocent, like you say he is. All right, then. About ten years ago, before I even met Henry, he was already working at this hospital. At the time, he was just a resident and had just started doing procedures on his own, and he was operating on a patient who was Riley's sister. She didn't make it. 
At first there was this whole toss up on whether it was malpractice or not, but it was thrown out eventually. I don't think that Riley ever forgave him, but as he started to learn more at medical school, he started to realize that Henry couldn't have done anything to stop it. So you see, he would have no reason to kill Henry. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. You've proven yourself to be very helpful. If you don't mind, Detective Murray, what did Mrs. Feldman say about Riley? Oh, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? She hasn't said anything about Mr. Putnam. I don't understand. Well, there was no way either you or Mr. Putnam were going to tell me the reality of his relationship with Henry, so... So you just made it up? Oh, I wouldn't put it that way. It doesn't matter what way you put it! What matters is there's now a boy who is going to be wrongfully convicted of murder, and it's because of me! Hang on. Who's being wrongfully convicted of murder? Have you solved the case? <laughs> don't you worry, Mrs. Felton! Detective Murray is just the best, most brilliant detective in all of New York! Of course he solved the case. Now, whether he solved the case correctly, that's the question! Enough! Who cares that his murder is innocent, as long as he still has his coveted reputation intact? You know who killed my husband, Detective? Who's been wrongfully convicted of murder? It's me! That's what you've decided isn't it, Detective Murray? I mean, it makes sense. Henry kills my sister, I poison him to get revenge. It's a classic murder. But I didn't do this, detective. You have to believe me. I mean, yeah, a lot of my past would be based off my sister's death. It's the whole reason I went to med school in the first place. So I could find out what happened to her. What? Almost ten years later? And I still don't know. I don't know what happened in that operating room. And I swear, that my past isn't based off that. I won't let the same thing happen in my future. Well, in the end, I guess it comes down to what you think. So, Detective, what do you think? Everyone out. Excuse me? I need to think. Everyone out. All right, all right, think. Just think. We got three suspects, all went in during the time that they could have killed Henry. What do we do first? Motives. We'll start with motives. First up, we have Dr. O'Brien. Passed up for a promotion. So what does she do? She formulates a plan. All she has to do is kill him and the job's hers. Once she has that job, she has enough power to convince the hospital not to look into the death of closely. Then there's Riley Putnam. His motive is more than obvious. The man kills his sister and he gets revenge. Simple as that. Then there's Vanessa Evans. You sedate the victim. The man starts dating her sister. She feels betrayed and bam, he's gone. But when I first started interviewing her, she was speaking about it in the present tense. My relationship with Henry is good. <coughs> yes. And then when I switched to speaking about it in the past tense, it was a bit weird. We stay after all. After a while, it became more comfortable. He's a good fit for Anna. She switched to the past sense with me. Now, what does that tell us? This murder is obviously cold calculated. The murderer would have to be as well. It's extremely unlikely that they'd make this rookie mistake. And Riley Putnam, why would 10 years to kill me? You'd think after 10 years, he'd have enough time to cool down. What? Almost 10 years later? And I still don't know. I don't know what happened to her in that operating room. Not know you become just too much, you just lost it. But I didn't do this, Detective. You have to believe me. Yes, I know, but I have to consider. You have to believe me. You know, you're right. You've proven yourself to be volatile, explosive. You would be in that state when you're about to kill Henry. And why would someone with such a temperament choose poison as their weapon? An acetone of that. Yes, it's commonly found in male nail polish remover and rubber cement, but not in the hospitals. No, this was land and murder, not something spur of the moment. So that leaves us with just one suspect, Dr. O'Brien. Your crime must be very important to you if you're willing to kill for it. It matters that there is now a boy who's going to be wrongfully convicted of murder, and it's because of me. What? There is a boy who is going to be wrongfully convicted of murder, and it's because of me. Yes. Why did you fight so hard to protect Riley? If he had been convicted, it only would have made it easier on you. He's like a son to me, and I swear. Yes, but would you really risk going to prison for him? I was the one who performed the operation on him, you see. Of course. 
You were the one who performed the operation. Why not just kill him then? No one would have batted an eye. It just doesn't make sense. I figured she could use some fun, so I stayed for a while, and we just hung out, even paint our nails for a bit. Say that again. So I stayed for a while, and we just hung out, even paint our nails for a bit. Dr. Feldman was poisoned by acetone, most commonly found in nail polish remover. You brought nail polish remover to the hospital. It was a bit weird. We stayed after all. It was a yes, bit I know. We it makes sense. It Henry kills weird. my sister by poisoning your revenge. It it's a we classic murder. You had a chance to get at the murder weapon now, so why not? I'll admit, 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 i And normally it would take about two hours for Astron to have any effect on the person poisoned, but with Henry, he was gone within the hour. How could you have known how long it took your husband to die? Oh, and Diana, if you need anything, anything at all, don't hesitate to ask. Financially, even. God knows why hospitals charge so much these days. You killed your husband so you wouldn't have to pay for his medical bills? But he was a surgeon. Surely money wasn't really a problem for him. We used to be a lot closer. Every once in a while we'd go down to that track about 20 minutes from here and watch the horses race. He wasn't that good at placing bets, but he had all the confidence in the world. So the gambling took a bit of a toll on your family? Well, Henry was a fairly reserved man. His work life and family life hardly ever met. So maybe your relationship wasn't quite as good as you liked it. You see, that's how he acted when I first met him. And there was that he actually was an insane workaholic who never left the hospital long enough to breathe. So you killed him? And then, when I asked if he had any enemies, of course you were all too happy to blame it on O'Brien. His colleague, Dr. O'Brien. Henry had just been promoted to chief of surgery, and everyone knows the job was between the two of them. But why O'Brien? She said herself that she would go out of her way to help you. She said that? After all I'd done for her? After the promotion, she would be high enough in the ranks to keep it covered up. You're right. She did cover it up, but not for herself, for you. She knew that you killed your own husband, and if she would have been the one who had been convicted, no one would have believed her when she said it was you. It was you. You killed your own husband. Everyone's getting really nervous out there. They're saying it's taking you too long to solve this. And they're right. I've been much too slow. This whole time, the solution has been staring me straight in the face. So you know who did it? Yes. It's about time that we told everyone who killed your husband.
already a cold and uncaring place. <laughs> Especially since the war. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll cope as I always do. Just me, Emmeline Seraphim Kassenbrook, the 11th or third. <laughs> Eyeliner thick, feet crossed, mind brooding. Miss Emmeline, she's here. Kassenbrook! It's your first and final warning. You know the policy on pre recorded inner monologues. Here's <laughs> <laughs> tired of listening to Mr. Mullins. That's it, Emmeline. Maybe the tension you learn to keep your thoughts to yourself and let them fester in the recesses of your brain to form psychological wounds like the rest of us. <laughs> in that moment, the rain was clear, as was my skin. <laughs> Unfortunately for you, sir, I don't have a brain. <laughs> you have brains. I have a mind. <laughs> Finally, 
made sense. Piper, you're a genius. No, I mean it. Not like the others. But of mind. I have like you are to my age. You're my best friends now. Absolutely not. She did not have a choice. <laughs> I finally found one. An acquaintance, oh wow. But the sun shines several degrees hotter than a chair. Like my temperament, I was furious. Semesters of lies, all lies. Mr. Mullins would not deceive me again. I knew what to do. Spite him. <laughs> Excel in school and watch him squirm. The resolution rose, to my, rose in my chest as I waited for the perfect opportunity. <sighs> okay. <laughs>
Tan of the town of Haleville, Alabama, during the Great Depression. The town is small, quaint, filled with people and cow life. The twin sisters, Plumby and Plumby, began to make homemade fireworks for the town festival of El Gato Avogado, with a drowned cat. Gosh, golly, Plumby, that's the best set of firecrackers I've ever seen in my life. Aw, oh, shucks, Plumby. You're just saying that to make me sweet on you. I know your game, and I won't do it. I will not steal any more gunpowder. Thou shalt tip thy sister into sin. That's what Sister Margaret said. She forgave my every sin the other day. Yes, she did. The devil be a-running as I'm a changed woman. You old fool, no nun can forgive no sinner. The only way we can be forgiven is if a priest go through this godforsaken town. Oh, that gorgeous Father William. Priesthood <laughs> should make poor ways of perfectly handsome men. He's got more flavor than fried chicken. <laughs> Drop the 
part of myself. <laughs> my stomach's growling like the lions of David's den. <laughs> we can't catch wild game without gunpowder. We can't kill the cows without anger of Krishna. And we can't think rationally without the food in our stomachs. The depression is an inconvenient time to be hungry. <laughs>
get a little bit inconvenient. Yeah, let's just talk 
good five minute set day, then there's a long time with one set day. You're all gonna go home. Sweet. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'd say so, man. So, you're pretty cool. You want to go eat lunch? Yeah, let's go right now. And then we'll sleep right through the cracks. And then we can pretend that Manhattan is on cast. 
there's so many of them that they won't even realize the difference anyway. <laughs> also try an email with all the important things highlighted in yellow. <laughs> Yo, look, I got an email. Dear Troy, here's the plan. You're going to tell Raul that you can't make it to the casting crew prom. You'll come later dressed as an ads crew member. You can tell Manhattan that she can go with Light's crew, and you'll meet up with her later. Uh, so I don't want to have to retype this as a text, so I'll just forward it to Manhattan. I guess all I have to do is not show up. That's what was highlighted in yellow, so I guess she has a plan and it'll all work out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the first of, hopefully not very many, casting crew proms! I'm so glad that you all can make it, and I hope you found a special someone to come with. I wonder where Troy is. I wonder if I'm supposed to go to that prom thing. It doesn't make sense that I'm here alone. Is it Troy supposed to be here? I read the email and she becomes an email. Maybe I should go meet her there. Maybe I should go to his house and meet her Get this looking 
right. We have a big day today. <laughs> Dad, cut the accent. <laughs> We're not Italian. <laughs> Gina, <laughs> do you agree with your brother? You quit calling me Gina. We just want our normal names back. Luigi, Gina, or John and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> you are a proud Italian man, and you, Gina Lasagna. <laughs> you, with the combination of the three of us, we are going to make this restaurant amazing. Dad, we haven't had a single customer in years. There's no way she can save it. Don't you talk like that to your father? But Dad. <laughs>
show. Because these taste buds are magical. They can taste any ingredient in any food. That's right. That's why they pay me the big bucks on this episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. We're going to take you to Flavor Town. <laughs> Mr. Gambino, nice to meet you. Yes, so welcome to a Gambino's place. It's lovely here. I want you to meet my cameraman, Joe. Oh, uh, yes, a pleasure to meet you. It's very nice to meet you, Mr. Gambino. Yeah, he gets, he gets some great shots. I'm sure you'll be impressed with him. This is my manager, Mary. Hello, Maddie. Uh, well, I'm very excited that you are here. Luckily, it's a bit of a, a small day today, so uh, you're okay. in luck. Even more food for me? Great. Alright, so, you know, I've been to a lot of restaurants, and a lot of Italian places. I've been to Italy, I've had their cuisine, it's pretty good. What are you going to bring to me today to prove to me that this is a great Italian restaurant? Well, I'm not really a much of the food man myself. My chef is really who you want to talk to, a real authentic Italian chef. We'll bring him out here, let's see him. Oh, Chef Dave! Oh, guy, it's an honor, it's an honor. Oh, look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, what sort of Italian dishes do you have prepared for me today? Oh, God, we got some great American food, uh, Italian food lined up for you. We got some burgers, some fries, some quesadillas. Oh, you're going to love it, guy, I'm telling you. Doesn't yeah. sound very Italian. Oh, but... trust me, trust me. I'll eat that anyway, let's see it. All right. Just feel free to walk around, see what everyone's eating. Right? All right. Do you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? We got a great episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. We're gonna take you to Flavor Town. <laughs> Let's get this guy. Oh, very nice to meet you. What's your name? My name is Gabriel. Gabo. Well, oh. Gabriel. Gabriel, nice to meet you. So, what are you eating today? Well, I am eating, uh, um, I believe it's an Italian burger. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> you did not just take my food. This is delicious. Mm. And the, no, the, way, the way the ingredients are blend. Okay. That is my... Keep the camera out of here, baby. <laughs> you know how great. I can't do this no more. No. That's okay. We'll move on. We'll move on. There's plenty of other people here at Gambino's Kitchen. This place is packed. So many zany characters. So many people to meet. That's the thing I love about this job. Let's see. Let's see who's next. <laughs>
story behind yourself to you, buddy. Yeah. My name, Joe. Hobo Joe, I know. Local star with that. I've actually just uh, got enough money to buy this food here. Yeah. My birthday. birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday to me. Yeah, you can, you can dig in as well, I guess. May I? out here and uh, beg a while, and mm. I saw the people and they looked really nice and hospitable and Italian. Wow, that's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. You know, Italians love them hospitality. You must be really hungry then. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what hunger is. Alright, well, nice meeting you. Come on, Joe. That's plenty of footage. <laughs> wow. Such Zany people we met here at Gambino's place on this episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I'm gonna take you to Flavor Town. <laughs> on this episode of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Well, uh, Guy, it really was a, such, a, such a pleasure for you to be here. Oh, yes, thank you so much for your wonderful restaurant and hospitality. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right, well, um, that's a wrap for the day. Good shoot, everyone. Oh, thank God, I'm starving. God, <laughs> Have you, something to eat. Okay, you, you ate a lot, a, a lot, a lot today. Um, you, you really need to cut it down on the calorie intake if you want to be alive before the next episode gets released. Remember what your doctor said. Yes, if my blood pressure gets too high, I'll die of hypertension. So what? What is the cause of your high blood pressure, guy? Food, yes, I know. But if I don't eat a lot in this episode, then the ratings won't be good enough for a second season. And you know we need that next season. I want to be in Subway's commercials, gosh dang it! <laughs> well, if you want our views to go up, you're going to have to go a lot harder than you did today. People want to see it get messy. Then we see the big, juicy dishes, not the stuff that we film today. Hopefully tomorrow Gambino brings out the big dishes. Good point you got there, Joe. No, 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 no. He, this is not healthy for him. He has neck rolls. Do you see this? What about his neck rolls? I would pay to watch those neck rolls any day, all right? Why?
not. Yeah, I know, but that's a pretty big dish. Look, have you seen the guy who eat anything? <laughs> yeah, I know, but I don't want to, like, hurt the guy. Come on. I wouldn't worry about it. I think we have to go big. We need this restaurant to boom again. Fine. We have to. A guy, we're ready! All right, Joe, camera on me. This is the money. Let's do it. All right, we're back in Gambino's place. Hopefully they got some good grub for us. Oh, guy, trust me. You've never seen anything like this before. Oh, I'm intrigued. Ooh. Are you ready? Lay it on me. What do you got for me? Let's do this. The key to success. The key to success. The key to success is excess. The key to success. The key to success. The key to success is excess. <laughs> When it comes to cooking, I am the master challenge for you to cook up. It'll make it faster. Prepare to be amazing. You and Chef Dave, open up your mouth while you got the food rave. Oh! <laughs> the, the, the key to success. The key to success is excess. <laughs> Welcome to the real kitchen, Mr. Yeti. Your bitch blood hair makes you look like a Yeti. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Add some sugar and some extra trans fat. Maybe some garlic to give it that zing, or a little bit of hot sauce to give it that steam. Oh! The key to success. The key to success. The key to success is excess. The key to success. The key to success. The key to success is excess. Lust for food, my 
my stomach turns. I'm burning alive in here. I'm all caught up in here. My frosted tips are melting in here.